This podcast could potentially have adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly the possibility of sexual content. <clears throat> Listener discretion is advised. Hello, Drinking With Authors fans. We have some pretty big news from your host here, Erica Lance. We are moving to change the format of the show to be one episode. So, there's a few episodes that were recorded the old way that we're doing the new way, and that's what you're listening to. So, thank you. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we love having you as fans. On to the show. Welcome to Drinking With Authors. I am your host, Erica Lance. My co-host today is the amazing Mark Muncy from Erie Travels. Hey, Um, gang. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And our guest today is Travis Horseman. Woo! Welcome. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So let's talk about what we're drinking real quick so people can drink along as long as you're at home and not driving. Right. Um, in some drinking with author swag, you get to get some of this, Travis, for being on the show. I put um, old Tennessee whiskeys, um, moonshine cherries in with lemonade. So, yes, like a boss. I, you can kind of see the cherry on the top. Yeah. Huh, so this is moonshine and lemonade and cherries. So that that's what happens. Nice. Um, Mark, what are you drinking? Uh, well, since I am uh, the designated driver still in stone recovery mode, uh, I am just drinking uh, plain black coffee in a black <laughs> coffee mug. Thank you very oh. much. I'm not doing any special, uh, you know, uh, horror coffee shop of horrors. I am just sticking with the, the black roast. So, wow, you got really boring really quickly. I know. I'm sorry. It's, it's recovering from surgery. It is. What it yeah. Is. I mean, I don't. I don't mean to get in the middle of this, but you're super right, well. I am chasing it with a little public water, so there you go. <laughs> I love it. Okay, Travis, what are you drinking? Uh, I am drinking like I am at a Christmas family gathering. I am drinking a White Russian, which is absolute with Kahlua and and cream. I love in a, that. In Here. a uh, old fashioned glass with a bee on it. Mm. I Jelly. love it. I love it. Okay, so. You have your amazing covers behind you. I always say these things for the people that are listening and not watching because you can watch mm-hmm. it on YouTube. Um, the covers are amazing. So for those that may not know you, what do you write? Uh, I write graphic novels and comics. Uh, right now, uh, they span uh, action adventure series uh, and horror, but I'm also getting ready to start a new mythology fantasy series very soon. Ooh. So, um, expanding my uh, sort of expanding my uh, my genres. And why did you go graphic novel? What made you choose that medium? Uh, very simply, um, I have a lot of I'm I have a lot of impatience writing prose. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I've been trying to write I've been trying to write novels for years, and I get very frustrated. Um, Actually, it was a specific idea that caused me to write Amiculous, uh, which is like the one right behind me here. Um, uh, I was struggling to write a novel, uh, but I, I'm more of a vi- I'm more visually inspired uh, than I am by, by. It was more frustrating as to write out a, se- a scene describing an image than having the actual image itself there with with dialogue. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, this is, I'm having some difficulty with this. I love comics. Why don't I try doing a, a comic book version of this? But it's like, well, that will probably be too long because what I have in mind is going to be like three, 400 pages long. So I'll try like a short 20 page project and see how I feel about that. And that 20 page project was basically the initial short story that I originally wrote for this, which eventually turned into 200 pages of Miculous, a secret history. Wow. And uh, yeah, I wrote that in, I mean, I'd been, I had not yet finished a draft of a novel up to this point, And I finished my first draft of Amiculous in nine months. So, wow. um, yeah. So it was your medium in which to go into Don Tom Don. It, it kind of was, you know, I mean, I, it's, um, it is uh, like, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a unique, it's, it's not film. It's not uh, prose. It's not, it's, it's a unique medium altogether. And I don't know why, but uh, it's, like I said, it, it worked with my sort of visually, insp- uh, visually inspired brain, I guess. No, that makes sense. So 
what about the artwork? Let's talk a little because we don't we, we haven't talked to a lot of graphic novel people mm -hmm. as of yet. So you're one of the few. Um, so let's talk a little bit about doing that. And also because graphic novels have to have the graphic part of graphic novels. So how did that all come together? Well, uh, and full disclosure, I uh, write and create everything except for the art. Uh, I partner with different artists on all of my projects. Um, finding the art, when after I wrote the script, uh, I had to go out and, and uh, find an artist to, uh, to collaborate with. Uh, weirdly enough, I found my artist on LinkedIn of all, pa of all places. And uh, LinkedIn? Yeah, LinkedIn. Oh. What? <laughs> they have, um, no, I'm not kidding. They have uh, they have like chat sites like Working Comics, Comic Book Professionals, etc., where you know writers and uh, writers and artists can uh, can chat, talk about like similar interests, and and get uh, projects going. And that's how I met my uh, artist for Amiculus, a fantastic uh, Italian artist named uh, Giancarlo Caracuzzo. Uh, he is he has been doing comics for I think over forty years now. And wow. you know, some of those include uh, work with DC and Marvel. He did the movie adaptation. He did the uh, he did the comic book adaptation of the Jonah Hex movie, among other things. That's and he even did a Batman title uh, not too long ago. He's done oh, tons, wow. and tons of the work, and he has uh, his. Uh, I mean, his signature. It's interesting because a lot of people say his signature style feels very kind of retro, like nineteen eighties. But I mean, I loved it. It was very gritty, very. Um, very, I mean, his it was it's a very gritty style, and it's one that I think worked really nicely for this period, for this book. Very cool. So, um, how many books now do have you? Because we met at ALA, so which ALA for everybody who doesn't know what that is, because you might not, is the American Libraries Association, right? And is that where we met? No, we met at Galaxy Con. Galaxy Con. Galaxy Con. Okay. Galaxy Con Columbus, yeah. That's fine. It's okay. I've had one of those. Too. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, not yeah. the same thing at all. So, um, what, uh, how many books do you have out? I've got to get all my questions. Mark, you better load up on questions. I'm, I'm getting ready. I'll say I was I, about to jump in, but you're, 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 no. you're taking all my thunder. It's all good. Well, uh, I initially did Amiculous as a three part series. Uh, I, cr I, Kickstarted uh, it in three parts, uh, so it is a three-volume set, which I eventually turned into a single book. Although, uh, I mean, I'm not averse to going back to the three-volume set if that's how people like uh, to, uh, you know, to digest their media. Uh, but yeah, we did it in three separate uh, Kickstarter campaigns. Uh, each book is approximately uh, 78, 70 to eighty pages, uh, uh, just chock full of story and art and um, we were able to, uh, uh, yeah, we were able to, I started, uh, like my first campaign was in 2014 and my last one was in 2016 and we managed to put it all together very nicely. Very cool. So have you hit the, have you gotten your books into like mainstream stores and stuff? Because it's a little different than just um, prose that end up on, you know, Kindle mm -hmm. Unlimited, for instance. <laughs> Where have you... <laughs> Where well, I've published. Uh, well, I have been self-publishing um, at this point. Um, you know, I've made I've made approaches to uh, I have made approaches to um, uh, to publishers. I even did get uh, a publishing deal uh, with a group called Action Lab, but that ended up falling through, and the publisher ended up going under before uh, anything ended up happening. Um, okay. And uh, I also I sell on Amazon and I sell at shows and I do have these in, in some select uh, comic book stores. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, there are there are stores that buy my books from Amazon and then feature them in their stores. But my distribution at this point is primarily via Amazon or via via shows. Understood. Understood, Mark. I will be quiet for two minutes. I, don't, <laughs> I know you're surprised by that, but I'm going that's, to. That's all good. No, no, um, no, I know, I, you know, that series has a very historical bent. So I wanted to know where, where, you know, where, what drew you into uh, the history of, especially of the Roman empire. So. Well, um, I have loved class. I mean, it's, I'm a weird kid. I was a weird kid. Uh, I have loved classical history, like Greek and Roman history since I was like, five or six years old. I mean, I got, 
I, I, I got a book for, for Christmas one year called the Dolores Book of Greek Myths, which was this beautifully illustrated uh, book from the 1960s uh, showing all of like compiling all of the Greek myths. Uh, I mean, it, uh, it it was kid friendly, but it didn't leave out any of like the splendor or some of the 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 epic quality of it. And I think that it, that may have been the place where my love of uh, classical history, my love of theater and drama, and my love for comics all came together was in that book. Yeah. So I mean, it turned me into a like passionate uh, classics uh, lover ever since. Fantastic. So yeah. Uh, uh, so inspirations then from graphic novels that, you know, what, what is your, uh, which, which are ones you would say you draw the most from? Well, uh, I am enormous, like probably a lot of people in my generation, I'm an enormous fan of Neil Gaiman and of Alan Moore. Um, the Sandman series was heavy. was, was a, was a heavy influence on Amiculous. Actually, there's a story in the Sandman series uh, called August that kind of inspired one of the basic threat, one of the, like the main thread of the story, um, which was set in ancient Rome. And it was about the emperor Augustus. And it, it's a very strange story because it shows uh, it's a story about the emperor Augustus as an old man and a dwarf named Lucius uh, who is also an actor pretending to be beggars so that they can make secret plans about the Roman empire. And it's like, it's, it, this is actually from a historic, from a story, a rumor about uh, Augustus from that period. And it's like, it's a brilliant story. Uh, and um, it really, uh, it was very, it was actually very influential in, in with the Miculus. Very nice. And then having an Italian artist, uh, you know, that, I'm sure that helped with the influence there. Uh, you know, for, do, 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 you had written the whole thing before the artist came on board or? Yes. Okay. Yep. Were there yep. any changes done due to the artist? Oh, yeah. I mean, I did make changes. Uh, I There were some things that, you know, when I saw them actually shown out, I was like, okay, maybe uh, maybe I could simplify this or I could make it. I mean, norm this is the great thing about working with an artist. No matter what you picture in your mind, nine out of ten times what they give you is better. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, they have a I, I kind of feel like writing and drawing sort of happens in different parts of the in different parts of the brain. You know, and uh, seeing what, you know, just seeing what he sent me and like what I originally had in mind, I was like, no, this is this is far superior. There's only one or two times where I had something so specific that I actually had to like diagram it out very few times. But like I said, 90 percent of the time, it was just like, wow, this is amazing what you sent me. So it was a, it was a great it was a great partnership. Awesome. Awesome. So what's what's uh, what's the uh, what was the, the follow up then? No. The follow-up? Uh, well, uh, after Amiculous, uh, I uh, sort of took a turn. That's when I took a turn into, into the more horror direction. And I did uh, Sugar Creek. Sugar Creek was actually a, uh, it was a short, it was a short screenplay that I had worked on that I had developed with a friend uh, that we were going to shoot. But then I thought, you know what, this would make a great, um, this would make a great short horror story comic book. And uh, with that one, and we we actually put that together with the idea that we would use the comic book to sort of promote uh, like a crowdfunder for the film. But again, this has sort of become like the main thing now. Um, Sugar Creek is like I said, it's a one shot horror story premised on the idea that if you subject a physical place repeatedly to violence over tens of thousands of years, it'll become self-aware and predatory. And then you build a town on top that doesn't know it's there until one extraordinarily bad day when everything goes critical mass. And um, this has been very popular, actually. Sugar Creek is probably one of my most popular uh, things it shows. And uh, I, I'm even planning a sequel series to it called Legends of Sugar Creek, going back through history and showing like how this town has been affected by this phenomenon. Okay. So what are your horror influences then? Uh, horror influences. Uh, this book in particular takes a lot from, it, it has a lot of the same feel, I would say, as like It or Stranger Things. I am a huge Stephen King fan. I was a huge Stephen King fan from like the age of 13. Uh, so, um, you know, just the existential dread that you feel, the, the incredible, delicious existential dread that you feel when you're reading some of his work is the sort of thing that I wanted to show in this. And, um, you know, that's uh, that was always a big 
uh, a big influence there. I, I have a question for you. So I'm going to go back a tick and then you can jump back in, Mark. So oh, okay, Sandman. So I got to ask, because you said this was one of your earlier influences. Mm-hmm. What did you think of the series? I love it. I love the first, uh, the, the first season of the series. Uh, I, um, that's the thing is I'm not, I know there are a lot of people who are married to a certain idea that they have in their head or like their original impression of it from the book. But one of the things that I'm aware of is like, you can't make a series that is the same thing as the book, or you can't make, I don't expect that. I'm not a purist in that sense. And I actually look forward to seeing how they're able to adapt it. Um, and I really love that. Um, and I, I, I think with just maybe a few, I mean, I was impressed honestly, because, uh, you know, it's taken 30 years to do it. And, you know, it's a difficult, it's difficult, like dense material to try to turn into a, into a series. And I thought, I, I, I mean, I personally loved it. I did too. I actually, and I love the, the liberties they did choose to take because, yeah. um, well, mainly I love the actors that they chose to take mm-hmm. those liberties with. Yeah. But um, what I thought was really interesting too, though, is it, it, you know, it's a graphic novel and everything. And since it's so much more a visual medium than a, say, a novel, right? Mm-hmm. Where in a novel, like, I'm just going to use this example, Hunger Games. A lot of people were pissed off by the casting of PETA in right. the Hunger Games. I thought he was brilliant. I thought he really encompassed the um, uh, characteristics of the character. Not necessarily mm-hmm. exactly what we thought he would look like. But the humbleness, the heroicness, you know, all that stuff that Peter was, right? Because yeah. Peter's the hero of that story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, it's different because you have an idea. They describe him, right? Stocky, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. But they don't like, it's not detailed where when it's in a graphic novel, it's very detailed. So you already yes. have an idea of what this character is supposed to look like, mm-hmm. right? And so I think that can be very different for fans getting upset because they're like, but, but there's a picture. You literally have a right. picture right here. What is he supposed to look like? Yeah. <laughs> How did you, you know, so I, I thought that was good. But I also, you know, I had the opportunity to listen to the audio book or audio drama, I should say, yeah. that Amazon did, which was really well done from the, the book. Too. And it was funny, though, because when my boyfriend was listening to it with me, he's like, this jumps all over the place. He's like, I can't track. And it occurred to me when I was watching it again, too. I'm like, this is not like a audiobook, which is mm-hmm. also interesting is you can't really make a graphic novel easily, even though they really tried and they had a great cast into an audiobook, because you're like, what the hell is even happening right now? Right. Like, following along. So my Follow up. So that was great on that. My my question for you is, what is it like being in the different genres? Because writing fantasy, writing, you know, that kind of thing, but writing horror is a very, as a horror writer, me and Mark are both horror writers. Hi, universe, we've got three horror writers on this call. Um, writing fantasy is very different than writing horror. Uh, well, I mean, there can be elements in both, honestly, I think. I mean, one of the things about, uh, just to go back to Amiculus for a second, I, I think that there are certain elements of horror that I incorporate into Amiculus. Not, I mean, it doesn't end up having the horror effect necessarily, but there's a point where, um, like in, in Amiculus, have, should I have taken an opportunity to say what Amiculus was actually about at some point? Go ahead, go ahead, it's your podcast. Go for it. I was about to do that, and then someone else had questions about Neil Gaiman yeah. stuff, so right. you know, it was all good. Well, I can do this really quick. Uh, I I can do this really quick and then I'll get to my point. Uh, Take your time. No elevator pitch. Give us the full pitch. (laughs) Sure. Uh, Amiculus is a, uh, it's an action adventure series in the vein. I like to say in the vein of V for Vendetta or Assassin's Creed in the ancient world. Uh, It's premised on the idea that Rome didn't fall, but was actually pushed, if you will, by a mysterious figure tearing it all down from the shadows. Uh, I mean, it's done in a very epic cinematic style, epic battles, conspiracy, betrayal, swirling around this mysterious figure 
this mysterious cloaked figure who the Romans aren't even sure whether he's human or not, in that he's able to destroy and blow through all of their traps, all of their conspiracies, all of their plans almost effortlessly, and figuring out who he is and how and why he's doing what he's doing to tear down uh, what is left of civilization uh, is crucial to them surviving and uh, Western civilization surviving. So that out of the way, <laughs> like I said, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, there are elements in the book where there's a historian in the book who is reading an account of the fall of Rome in which Amiculus is the major player. And as he's reading, there is a point in the library where he's hearing someone that he hears someone whispering, you know, to him, like, and he, he, he freaks out and he looks all around and it turns into one of those situations where you're like a dark cavernous library and all of that. Everything, the icons all seem to be moving and looking at you, and you don't know where the voice is coming from. And uh, you know, and um, I, I, I utilize that. Like that's a that's a classic horror trope that I think that people use in order to build tension, and I use that in Amiculus. But I also, you know, um, I mean, I mean, the original question I believe you said was how do you move between the different genres? And like I said, I like to incorporate some of those things sort of interchangeably with each other you know i uh, i incorporate uh, there's a heavily there's kind of a heavy history element to uh sugar creek that i bring into that as well uh and there's some humor in it as well uh you know because horror is never i don't really feel like you, it's horror is not all horror all the time you have to balance it with you know whatever the situation calls for you know the you know the two the two uh, characters are joking with one another or commiserating over something or you know just uh I, I feel like it's um, just sort of writing the situation more than really the, the, the genre. No, I, I no, that's true. I think with horror, I find the difference is you, you there's a bit of tension mm-hmm. and there's a bit of, it depends on the kind of horror, I guess. Hey listeners, you know me, Eric Lance. You're just listening to me in the podcast that you have, but guess what? I'm doing something new. Yeah, she's joining me, Mark Muncy, the author of the Erie, Florida book series in Erie, Appalachia. And we are hosting a new podcast called Erie Travels. Woo-woo, Erie Travels, which covers things like ghosts, cryptids, weird stuff, UFOs, men in black, all kinds of fun things that people talk about and I'm sure you've discussed with friends. Yep, and you can listen to us on your favorite podcast platform of choice or find us at eerietravels.com and join in the fun and all the spooky goodness. And of course, Mark, what do we always say? We'll see you on the other side. So let's talk about um, reviews and audiences, Travis. What has that been like now that you've you've put your little baby into the wild? Um, well, you know, uh, audiences have been generally very positive. Um, I will say, uh, I mean, anything relating to history is usually a hard sell. That's what I have found, uh, at shows or online or anywhere, because I think we have, I think so many people have had such terrible history teachers that they're used to seeing it as like this laborious slog of facts and figures and things like that. Um, but I mean, the, I mean, like I said, that's, that's the reason why it's it's useful for me to equate it to something else that people are aware of. You know, it's, it's a pretty common thing to do. It's like, it's kind of like this, it's got this feel, it's got that feel to make it more familiar, to give it a, give people who might not have such, uh, might not have an appetite for history initially a bridge in. And then, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, I'm not really a history person at all, but I was captivated. I was caught up in this from like the, from the very first page, you know, that's a, that's a thing. There have been a few people, you know, uh, there have been some, I, I found that like each part of it, when people don't have the full story, that's when, I mean, there are some reviews was like, I don't see where this is going. I don't know why this is, you know, I don't know what's happening. You know, having the whole though, it's mm-hmm. like, you know, that's, uh, it's only, I would say that most audience and, uh, and, and reviewer responses have been, have been positive. I would I'd say that one of the points that I think that is appropriate for Amiculus is it is a very it's a dense story. There's a lot going on, and probably the biggest complaint, if I were to say, was it's got a lot of characters. 
There are a lot of characters in it to keep track of. In fact, I actually, on the request of one of my Kickstarter fans, uh, I created a who's who, like a, uh, I created a sort of a character breakdown of all the major characters that they can refer to as they're reading, which they found very helpful. I mean, when I'm writing it, it's like, you know, I mean, I don't think of these things as like, I know who each one, I know what each one of these guys are going to do, but it's like other people's like, well, wait a minute. Okay. I had to go back and see what the relationship was. And so, I mean, I get that. I definitely get that. It's, it's got, it's got, it's, it's done on an epic scale and it's got kind of an epic cast. And I know that can be a little overwhelming for some people. Have you thought about doing a thing of side stories then? Like a prequel? Oh yeah. Yeah. I actually, uh, am that, that's a, another project that, uh, I have been working on. Uh, a, there is a prequel for this that I am working on, uh, that, um, the thing is I, I have to, I, I'm, I'm a little paranoid because it's like, okay, I want to make sure enough people are reading the actual or the, the first book to, before getting into a second one, because, you know, I feel like I, I want to make this, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that there's an audience for it, I guess, to a certain degree. And I, I, I'm still, I still feel like I'm working on that a little bit. No, I mean, that makes sense. You can always do short little ones though. And mm. um, see, because I think sometimes it's interesting when you find your audience, because there is an audience for everything. Yeah. It's just, how do you find it? And when do you find it? And what is the catalyst to finding that particular audience for, yep. you know, different things and i you know if if you're getting feedback from the audience going hey yeah. um, we don't know who these characters oh are. Just, yeah go ahead mark you were gone again for about two seconds but we're back that's okay it's okay. gonna happen just go with it we're just drinking. go with it all right just so, wing it now my my question is again uh you know so you know back to roman since we're discussing uh mm -hmm. uh your your first work uh the uh I'm afraid I'm going to mispronounce it. So I'm like, trying to, I'm trying to avoid amiculous, right? So, yeah, that's uh, interestingly, if, if I may interject, that's been another yeah. thing that's kind of confused people because it's, it's, it, well, it's backwards on your screen, but it's yeah. spelled in the Roman way, A M I C B L B S. Those V's are U's, but people are like, how do you pronounce that? And even when I tell them those are U's, it's like, it's amiculous. I like to compare it to like, you know, banicula or something like that. You That's know, nice. Yeah. Sort of I was, that, I was actually thinking Reptilicus, which is an old uh, Sid yeah. Bank film, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it had a very, uh, yeah, I, I'll be honest. When I saw it at uh, galaxy con, it had a very, uh, I Claudius meets 300 kind of feel to it. And nice. uh, that's, and that's what I drew me to it. Uh, I'll be, to be fair, it's sitting on my to read pile. I haven't gotten to it yeah. yet, but, uh, but it was, we, we picked up a ton at galaxy con, so I couldn't <laughs> help it. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, no, let's say you're, you know, you're recasting it to use as, as a series. Now Netflix has approached you mm -hmm. and they want you to, you know, pick your top five for your cast there. Who, who do you see playing the leads? Did you have, when you're writing it as a, Graphic mm -hmm. novel, do you have that? You were saying the other one you wrote is a screenplay. So I'm sure you right. kind of had some characters in mind. What about this one? Well, um, it's interesting you say that because um, I use uh, real world actors and people like that as uh, models for some of my characters. I mean, I don't know how, uh, how, how um, I don't actually know how well this would work because probably all of them are too old. But like the two main characters, uh, Orestes, and uh, the Emperor Romulus. The Emperor Romulus is a 12-year-old boy. He's the last emperor of Rome. It's interesting because the character that I had in mind, the actor I had in mind for him, the one I kind of based him on was Thomas Sangster, who actually was in a movie uh, called The Last Legion, where he did play that character. He wow. played, yeah, he played that's the boy Emperor back. Romulus. Orestes, uh, I wanted someone, Orestes plays his father, who is very domineering, very brutal, very threatening, just like this menacing presence hovering him over him all the time. And for him, I, um, I always had an impression of like a younger Clancy Brown, you know, just that was, that. The, the, that was the, uh, that was the image that I had in my head the whole time. And it, yeah, I and uh, you know those those were some of the people that I uh, um, kind of had in mind for those characters. I don't know who I would cast now for those. I'd have to take a look and see. 
um, you know, just sort of to reevaluate that. But well, we can those- we can pick sorry D H Clancy Brown. I mean, he'd still do it. He'd do, <laughs> yeah. He'll do anything. He's great. So yeah. Um, you oh. might also know uh, Thomas Sangster. I mentioned him. He was also in. Uh, he was one of the supporting characters in the Maze Runner movies. British actor. I think he has. Yeah. I'm not sure if he still goes by Sangster or by like a multi hyphenate name, but yeah, mm. he's a. Yeah, but there's a movie like The Last Legion where he played the actual character that I wrote in the book. So nice. Oh wow. Well, he didn't play my character. He played the, their version of it. But oh, yeah. I got it. The historical version. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, yeah. the, where history comes from. I've yes, got yes, it. yes, yes. Right. I'm paying attention. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't sure how far you were into your drink yet. So <laughs> <laughs> your tone, your tone <laughs> is not appreciated right now. Sorry, I'm too sober for this today. I apologize. You're way too sober for this today. <laughs> anyway. I'll fix it next time. I promise. Lies, lies, and slander. <laughs> so now that we've cast the movie, um, what are some fun fan interactions you've had? What are some things that people have said that you were kind of surprised about? Uh, well, I think one of the most fun interactions was a uh, one of my Kickstarter fans who was like a a huge fan, like through all three books. He, I ran into him at a show in DC. And he's like, oh, my God, can you draw one of these characters for me? I'm like, "Uh, well, I mean, I don't. But he's like, it's okay. I just want to see like I just want to see how you would draw him. And I'm like, all right. And I I just did like this pen and ink drawing of a Maculus. He's like, that is so cool. And I'm like, really? But um, that was that was interesting. That was the first time anyone has ever asked the writer to draw something. So that was kind of unusual. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's like, you do know which role I play in this, don't you? And he's like, no, no, I just wanted to see your version of him. So, yeah, that was a lot wow. of fun. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, no, that that is weird. Mark, have you been ever asked to draw? No, because your wife does all the drawing. My wife does the amazing art for my books because I couldn't afford to hire an artist. So I uh, so I married one. Uh, but uh, but yeah, what I, I was asked to draw my take on a dog man and it was very much a stick figure. <laughs> uh, so and and I and I purposely drew it as worse as I possibly could, and then you know it was funny because the guy looked over and went, "Oh, that's kind of cool." <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Okay, so you've done a lot of conventions. What has? How do you feel about doing conventions? Uh, I love I love conventions. I love the opportunity to you know make. I mean. The opportunity to base, I mean, it's not the most practical way of doing it, but I kind of like the idea of creating a new fan, like one in real time, one at a time, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, the chance to like really, you know, okay, okay, let's see what did the, you know, what do people really think about this? I'd like create new relationships, you know, kind of, Uh, I like the, I like the, uh, the person to person interaction. Uh, I mean, and um, it's interesting the people who really seem into it are not the ones that you always expect all the time too, you know? And uh, like that, that, that's always, that's always, I mean, I just did um, uh, my last big show is uh, the uh, C2E2. Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. And I love that show. This is actually only my second time going. And that is a wonderful show for, for meeting fans and people who are really in, it seems like a lot of shows don't do don't play up the comics portion of it, and especially not the independent uh, the independent uh, writers in comics. Mm-hmm. I should include writers too, because I mean it's it's about you know independent artists, not just not just comics. But I mean this is a, this is a show that people who come to it like are actively looking for new for for new authors, new new artists, uh, new uh, new writers. And, um, you know, that's something that I feel it kind of gets overlooked at a lot at some shows. Yeah. You know? Very true. And um, that's, that's, I mean, that's what, I mean, I love that. Just people who are like, they come there specifically saying, I want to know what the, where the new stuff is. I want to know where like the, the fresh new ideas are coming from. And that's, mm, that's great. Oh, I agree a hundred percent. And I think that a lot of people should just know in general, there are a lot of convention at most conventions. You can find new stuff. You just have to look for it. 
Yep. Yeah. You know, and hopefully you have people that actually want to interact about their work because that's a whole other thing of the people that sit behind the desk. And I'm like, <laughs> listen, you introvert. It doesn't work <laughs> like that. You're surrounded. Yeah. You're at a nerd con. Everybody's an introvert. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has to stop talking. Ugh. Yeah, that's that's the weird thing is I am very much I am very much I would consider myself an extroverted introvert, you know, uh, you know, there are different, there are different uh, spectrums of introversion, I think. And I get very talky and I'm not the sort of person who is normally that chatty in a regular day, but I get very talky, very chatty and very outgoing in shows like these because it just, it's, it's the rare situation where it kind of, um, it, it um, sort of charges me up rather than, you know, wears me down. No, I th I think that's great because I, I find that it's a lot of fun. And then by the end of the day, I'm like thoroughly exhausted, like just mentally exhausted mm -hmm. from talking to people the entire yeah. day. It's so much fun. But by the time you get home, like, especially if you're hanging out with other people from the con and you get there, you're like, just don't talk. Right. No, absolutely. You don't need any talking. Decompression. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fine. Just sit and eat quietly. So what are your, so what is, what's up next for you? What are the next adventures you've got going? Well, uh, like I mentioned, I am working on a new uh, limited series, and uh, I'm working on a new uh, a new uh, mini series uh, with a brand new artist. Uh, uh, in this series, I'm going back into um, into the ancient world, into ancient history, but with sort of a mythology fantasy bent to it. Um, this new series is going to be a seven issue series called Pythia. And it's about uh, the Pythia was the Oracle of Delphi, the Oracle of uh, the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi in Greece, who uh, told people, you know, basically uh, gave premonitions of the future, told you know, they divined the future for people. Some very famous divinations, and um, this is one that the the premise of this story is actually uh, I, I like. It, it makes sense. Someone told me once that uh, stories all take place toward the end of a story, like the end of it, like all stories take place very close to the end of a story, an overall thing. And this one is very much the same way. This takes place um, at the point that uh, Christianity is starting to push paganism out and uh, the, the cult has fallen on very hard times and is ready to go under. But then the pagan Roman emperor Julian comes in and he's about reasserting the old pagan gods. And he comes to the Oracle and says, um, I will revive your cult. If you give me a premonition of victory in my next war. And the Pythia agrees to this, but as she's going into her vision, she is visited by five of her predecessors who tell her not only can she not give Julian that premonition, she has to use it to destroy him and Apollo in order to save the world. Oh, that's pretty uh, epic. Yeah. And it's interesting because like the, the whole thing in real time, it's all happening inside her head. The whole thing in real time takes place in 30 minutes maximum, but it spans thousands of years in her head in what she's going through. So, and I'm, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. That's very that's very you know game esque. So that's good. So yeah. Yeah, no, that's very deep. Woo! So many levels. Well, that's kind of exciting. Yeah, that's it's very... kind of exciting. That's very exciting. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, and I'm working with uh I'm working with a new artist uh on this. Uh her name is uh Jesse Robinson, and she is a phenomenal, just a phenomenal artist. She does a, uh, she actually, she does a web, she does a web comic. She actually has a, she's, uh, has a web comic that's been running like six or seven years now called Roxy, which is this very whimsical, uh, cartoon about a very interesting, about some, about a person basically struggling, uh, with, you know, the daily cringe of being an introvert in an extroverted world sort of thing. And it's, it's a really delightful comic, but she also has this body of work that is, I mean, just, I mean, like epic in scope, like it, her, her range of talent is amazing. Like it goes, she can go from doing cute web comics to basically she could illustrate Lord of the Rings is what I'm saying, you know? Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, and she's uh, like more toward 
that end, the latter end of that with uh, with Pythia, she's really given just a wonderful signature look to the story. And I'm really looking, the first issue of which will be coming out in May. Was this another Very Kickstarter cool. to start? Uh, well, I'll be kickstarting. I plan a kickstart uh, to kickstart the next several issues, uh, probably be doing two Kickstarters for issues one through three and then four through seven. Uh, so this is, I like, it's usually, I like to have something in hand before starting, you know, so people know it's like, this is a real thing. This is the thing that is yeah. already partially realized. So, you know, I think the, people like that because sometimes yeah. Kickstarters don't end up with things realized. Yep. Yeah which is unfortunate, but yes, it happens. So that is, that's very, very cool. Have you thought about turning any of this into video games? Have you talked to anybody about that? Oh, man. Oh, oh yes, I've touched <laughs> on something there. I would have another zip while you explain what I touched on. <laughs> I mean, I've gotten, people have said, you know, you should turn this into an RPG. You should turn this into a video game. You should turn this into a card game, you know? And I'm like, wow, I don't even know where to begin with that. That's the, all of those are magnificent ideas, but I mean, I feel like I would need to work with someone a little bit uh, better versed in that sort of thing than I am. And I'm right now, I'm just, I have my hands full focus on the writing and just the, 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 the this part, but no, I mean, that's a, that's a, that, that's a great idea. Um, one of the, th like with, um, I used to have uh, a map of like the world of Amiculus and, the, and ancient Rome that I would have on the table that my artist drew and is in the book. And people would look at that and it's like, man, that would make a great tabletop, you know, uh, mm -hmm. tabletop game. And I'm like, okay, wow. And it's like, you know, all the, the this has been something that I've, I've heard a few times and gosh, I really wish that I knew where to start with that. But uh, I mean, well, there is a company called Storytellers Forge that I'm very yeah. familiar with, ironically. Uh -huh. um, it's actually a gaming company that my uh, publishing company is partnered with, but their oh. whole thing is to help people bring their books and their worlds to um, being role-playing games. Awesome. Yeah. So they're pretty neat. So whenever you can come up for air on your project, <laughs> you can check out Storytellers for it. Tellers. So, okay. Mark, do you have any final questions before we do shameless self-promotion? Okay, yeah. Uh, let's see. So you've 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 got C two E two, you did Galaxy Con. Uh, what what are some of the other cons people can find you at over the next you know rest of the rest of twenty twenty three? Well, I will be. I a lot of the a lot of the cons that I do are kind of in the uh, in the Midwest region. I have gone outside of that a few times. Uh, I've done a few on the East Coast. I did, uh, like I said, I did. Uh, SPX in uh, in DC and uh, a couple of other things, but coming up, my my next con is actually in Pittsburgh. It's uh, Three Rivers Comic Con, and then I'll be doing uh, one in Huntington, West Virginia. It's a Huntington uh, Comic and Toy Con, uh, Cincinnati Comic Expo. Um, still working on getting into New York, but uh, we'll see. Uh, and, uh, uh, I mean, I also, this is past this year, but I also do fan expo Cleveland. Nice. Uh, I, like I said, I'd like to branch out more, uh, a little bit, but yeah, uh, that's, I do probably like anywhere between 12 and 15 shows a year. Nice. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't don't poo poo that. Is that not being I'll, a lot? I'll say. Yeah. Uh, I. Yeah. You know, my first couple of years, I, I was happy to get six a year, and now I'm uh, now I'm doing quite a bit more than that. But it's all you know, twelve a year is good. So. Yeah. Yeah. No. Totally. That's a ridiculous amount. Okay. Hello, Drinking with Authors fans. This is your host Erica Lance. Because of the change of the format of the show, welcome to the literary briefs portion. Enjoy. Okay. Rapid fire question. Are you ready? I am ready. What is your favorite book of all time? Favorite book of all time is uh, Watership Down. Mm. That Very is nice. a heavy book. <laughs> yes. I like that you smiled right when you said yeah. that. <laughs> yes. Why is that your favorite book? Uh, it was a just a seminal part of my childhood, honestly. And uh, it's, it's a great book example of how a book can be intense and gritty and also still a great children's book i think there was definitely many layers to that yeah yes 
Yes, I love that. I actually, I remember watching the movie for the first time and um, what, guess, I feel like children's movies were a little different when I was younger. Yeah. What um, back then? Um, because also like the, the, what is it? Um, oh my gosh, my brain just died. Oh, where the red fern grows. Mm. Another one that you don't walk away going, that was a great movie. You, you, you kind of feel it. It hits. It There's is. many feels, lots of feels um, with those old yellers. And, uh, yeah. Did you read his other, I, I know Watership Down was his big one, but I liked to, he did one called uh, Traveler, and it was okay. the view of the Civil War from Robert E. Lee's horse. Huh. And it's, it's if you like your history, that's a hard one to get because it's, yeah. you know, for reasons, but, uh, you know, hard to you were going to mention Shardick. Oh, yeah, that's good, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Next question. Least favorite book. Least favorite book. Wow, there are so many. It's hard to... How rapid fire are we talking here? Can I hem and haw? You can hem and haw. It's your podcast. Yeah. Um, I'm going to find oh, the cherry oh. at the bottom of this. I actually have a great least favorite book. Uh, okay. I hope that the author doesn't see this and sue me. But it's yeah. uh, it's a book. It was actually a historical fiction novel called Fire in the East by a man named Harry. I kid you not. Harry Sidebottom. Oh. Um, it's, a, it's a historical. Side bottom? Harry yep. Sidebottom. Okay. Yeah. And um, it's it's a it's a historical fiction, and it kind of is sort of exemplary to me of the way historic of, way, of the way historical fiction books should not be written, in that uh, it's chock full of uh, historical information, but very light on plot and very light on character development. Uh, so it was like, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of information in this, but the characters are cardboard cutouts. So why would I read this? I actually didn't even finish it. Well, wow, he he is a, a British author. Yeah. Well, that's unfortunate. That's, uh, that was cruel, but I hope he doesn't listen to this in soon. It doesn't. Here's the thing. This is the truth. Somebody said this. Yes. Yeah. The other day on the podcast. Now I don't remember what day it was. I didn't even know it was Wednesday today until about mid afternoon. It's been that crazy with construction here. Mm. But um, this is what you think. This isn't like yeah. if somehow what you say, then we're dive bombing the books. It's just yeah. your thoughts on things. I mean, I want to say, I will say, I have an incredible respect for the amount of research he put into this. But at the same time, like I said, it's the example of how you, I don't think you should, uh, it's a great example of how historical fiction should not be written, which is to lean too heavily on the research. You know, yeah. you have to actually craft a storyline and, and, and compelling characters who are compelled by something other than what history has already dictated about them. Yeah, otherwise you're just making a history book and it's right. uh, that's more yeah. my field. So and they that reads like stereo instructions, not your book, Mark, but a lot uh, of books. Mine's on folklore, history. so yeah. I'm yeah, good. Like, I do folklore, so it's a little different. So yeah. well, I mean, but you tell the story of the folklore. I I know what he's talking about though, because I've read several books that are like that, that they it's very accurate. It's just mm -hmm. they end up writing something in that reads like a stereo instruction manual. Yeah. yeah. Handbook for the recently deceased, but not nearly as cool. <laughs> okay. So what is um, your favorite snack while you're writing? My favorite snack? Uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, I would say. You do eat, right? <laughs> I do eat, yes. Uh, probably sour gummy bears. I'm the worst. No, that's okay. <laughs> no judgment here. This is a no judgment. Yeah. This is a no judgment zone as I'm eating. Look, I got the other third cherry. You see the yeah, you got it. You got it. Let me just uh, say, these have been soaked in moonshine, so probably let loose. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what about your favorite book to TV show or movie? Like, you thought they did a really good job. Favorite book to TV show or movie? Um, Gosh. Uh, well, we did just, I mean, I did what I, I would say definitely, uh, the first season of the Sandman. I think that was yeah. something that came up at one point, but, uh, you know, uh, that we, I talked about, uh, that was as an example of how, uh, of a good adaptation of a book to my mind that doesn't, that isn't enslaved to the source material. I also thought, have you? If you're familiar with the HBO series Watchmen, mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. 
that's actually a great example of the movie versus that series is a great example of adaptations as well. Speaking of like teachable moments, I hated the movie, even though the movie was uh, the movie was painfully loyal to the graphic novel. I felt like it was a paint by numbers of the graphic novel, if that makes sense. It had all of the beats, but none of the spirit. Whereas I think that the HBO series captured the spirit of the graphic novel perfectly, even though it wasn't about the graphic novel. Does that make sense? It does. It, it, it encompassed the world very well. Yes. yes. I loved yeah. the series. I did not so much love the movie, even though the movie was technically, and I mean this in a very literal sense, technically more fa- faithful. That's really interesting. You know, the last 30 minutes. <laughs> what did you just say, Mark? It's not until the last 30 minutes when they went mm-hmm. off the rails. So <laughs> yeah. Be nice. Um, well, I mean, the fact that it was so faithful and then suddenly we're just going to just change the ending. It's fine. Nobody, nobody cares. Like you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they tested it with an audience. It didn't go well. So that's how that goes. Right. Isn't that how it that's is supposed to work? <laughs> yeah. All I know is Alan Moore hates anything that is done of any of his stuff. So, you know, you know, you could do the perfect movie of one of his books and he would still hate it because that's just he doesn't like interpretations of his stuff so that said travis who would you want to direct your stuff who would i want to direct my stuff um you know i'm not as intimately familiar with directors and director styles necessarily but um um i would be again it would be someone who i think was more who wanted rather i I'm not a purist about that sort of thing. I want the spirit to be met. I would want the spirit of the work to be met rather than like a, a blow by blow of the actual thing. You know, you, that's that's the thing. If I feel like the director, if I felt like the director had the had my vision in mind when they were doing it, no matter how they did it, that's what I care about. You know. Mm-hmm. So on a scale of like for your horror, your horror comic Sugar Creek, uh, from uh, you know the scale of Sam Raimi. You know, at the top there, Evil Dead yeah. style, <laughs> down to you know, you know, you know, Grindhouse style. What what would you somewhere in the middle there, or what do you think? Um, I'm trying to think honestly. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a fairly he- heavy uh, suspense element in uh, in a fairly heavily psychological horror element in Sugar Creek. So I'm trying to think of who does that well. Like the guy um, like Hereditary or or James yeah. Bond, the Conjuring movies, that kind of thing. Oh yeah, well no, not that. Not that. Okay. Not, I mean the, I think <laughs> the, conjur- the Conjuring and things like that rely too much on jump scares. I, I hate. Good I point. don't find them scary. I just find them like they 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 take years off my life, but I don't find them scary. I find them annoying. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So then a bit more uh, Hereditary, and whose name is? Yeah. 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 Uh, but that's good. Okay. All right. Or, so then- oh, you know, the, the movie I was thinking of, have you ever seen the movie? Uh, um, they come at night. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's been a while. So that yeah, is that was- a wonderfully suspenseful and scary movie to me, even though it doesn't seem like a horror movie in the traditional it's, sense, but it, yeah. it does suspense so very well. It does have a good vibe to that one. Yeah. So, yeah. That def- that definitely was a fun one. Um, you know what one has a really good I, I think a lot of people forget about this one, what lies beneath. Ooh. Yeah. Was, Harrison Ford and Michelle yeah, Pfeiffer. Yeah, yeah. 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 That one just to me, like that's one of the that it does the storyline, does the characters, has the thing mm-hmm. where it's not scary the whole time. It's just how they set up things based on the interpretation of the person, which I think is mm. Um, very unique in some films is what is the point of view we're actually viewing this scene from. Right. Right. I think sometimes that's forgotten. That's a whole different topic, but I do think sometimes because you look at stuff and you're going, what are we watching here? You know, like, are we watching from the kid's point of view or watching from the wife's point of view? Because it's different points of view how you see something like that. Anyway, I'm going to digress. Getting back, what mythical creature would you be if you could be any mythical creature history buff? Um, I am taken with the manticore. Oh, we haven't had that one before. Oh, Why with the manticore? Well, first of all, you're going to have to probably explain to some of the listeners what the hell a manticore is. Uh, a manticore, I think, comes from Arabian mythology, but although it showed up in medieval European mythology, uh, a manticore is a 
creature with the body of a lion and the face of a person and a face of a human and the tail of a scorpion. But it also has uh, multiple rows of teeth like a shark. And a bite from the manticore is poisonous and always fatal. Well, that's one way to go about it. I guess that would solve all your problems. Just like, yeah. and I'm done with you, chomp. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to comic books. What? Yeah. Uh, who is your favorite superhero? Superman. That may sound really like uh, Luddite, perhaps, but I have always, uh, I just like, I mean, the the, the real spirit behind Superman uh, is, I mean, he's always been what I think a superhero should be. And, um, you know, setting aside some of the more recent unfortunate adaptations of him, I really think so. You know, this is just, it's very interesting, the DC universe and the redo, the redo, the redo, the redo, the redo, the redo, the redo. redo. Yeah. I'm kind of the redo. So uh, who's your favorite supervillain then? Favorite super villain. Um, wow. Um, gosh, sorry. Um, That's okay. You've been drinking right along with me. Yeah, yeah, I was saying that. Was drinking, drinking in, so it's all um, I mean, who, I think it would be, gosh, I'm trying to think of who it would be. It would be someone who, it would be someone who gets what he who gets what he wants through through guile and cunning and not through brute strength. Um, I mean, Lex Luthor would be a little obvious, but uh, I mean, it is interesting that he is put up against Superman because they're kind of like an unstoppable force versus an immovable object. I mean, Superman can never really defeat Lex Luthor because in order to do that, he would have to become a villain himself. So, you know, but uh, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think like, um, yeah. Hmm? Well, from one of, I mean, even though it's obvious, maybe let's just say Lex Luthor for right now. <laughs> works. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll go with that. Um, <laughs> what is your favorite weird food combination? My favorite weird food combination? I don't know how weird it is. Um, I like, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I really enjoy scrambled eggs with hot sauce. I don't know if that's weird. I don't that's think it is weird. In the that's South, that's 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 required eating. So I was gonna say that's normal. If you don't answer yes, well, well, well maybe since you're above the Mason Dixon line, you know, that you don't you know you it may be weird up there, but down here. Yeah, yeah. well, no, I mean that's the only way I ate them, honestly. But <laughs> um I don't know, weird food combinations. I don't typically like mixing things that don't make sense together. Um uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean I'm I guess I'm pretty basic in that regard. Quirks. Works. All right. So when you're when, when you're writing, do you like to listen to music? I do. Or, all right. What's your playlist? Um, I mean, it's kind of all over the place. I mean, uh, depending. I like contemplative music, sort of introspective type of stuff. Um, you know, I don't necessarily go for party jams because I, I don't know. I just like things that sort of kind of both inspire and sort of also sit there in the background and kind of quietly influence what I'm doing, I'd say. Okay. What about, um, what is your desert island book? My desert island book? You get one um, book, you're on an island. Which one are you reading over and over again? Uh, it might be World War Z, honestly. Not a problem. That That is another movie TV, uh, movie book conversation we can have. Yeah, um, speaking of audio adaptations books. that did not meet the standard of the book. But, um, no, oh. I lo- go ahead. No, I was just gonna say the audiobook is, yeah. is amazing because yeah, it's nice having your dad Mel Brooks be able to get every right. person in Hollywood to record your audiobook. So, <laughs> like you do. No, I have I have I've worn out multiple copies of that book. I love that book. Yeah, agreed. That's that's a proper example of how much doing research but still having amazing characters. Oh my god! Yeah, what did they call him? The Studs Turkle of Zombie Journalism. That's <laughs> perfect. Like that. that's, that's amazing. You know, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. We love we love Max Brooks here. He's a he's a he's a good friend. Yeah. So but, uh, <laughs> uh all right. So speaking of audiobooks, who who narrates your audiobook? Do you do a full cast recording or do you have one in particular? And is it Clancy Brown? <laughs> <laughs> Clancy Brown would be a great get. I won't I won't deny that. I mean, I have that that man is mad talented. 
I mean, he does. I that may be. I mean, I going back to Lex Luthor. I love his. I love his version of him. I mean, I love that he, the Justice League animated. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and one of my <laughs> one of my favorite episodes actually of that was the one where he where Lex Luthor and the Flash switched bodies, oh, and yes. uh, Clancy Brown had to do. Um, Clancy Brown had to play Lex Luthor being inhabited by the Flash, pretending to be Lex Luthor at one point. And oh my God, it was the best. One of the greatest voice awesome. acting bits in history. <laughs> I loved it. I love how he's able to go. He's he's a Shakespearean actor. He's a dramatic actor. He can do comedy. He I don't know what he can't do, honestly. Yeah, you know, I, he goes back to Buckaroo Bonsai, so he's a win on my book. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah. that's for me, so... Did you just try to figure out a way to bring up Buckaroo Bond? I had to. I always do. You know that. He does. He somehow figures out how to bring up Buckaroo well, Bond. He brought up Clancy Brown, not me. Uh, so we're good. So oh, yeah. you know what? Don't even try to blame him for this. <laughs> Clancy Brown was rawhide. It's all good. So it's all good. Yeah. Oh my god. He's one of the Hong Kong Cavaliers. So. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> what about? Do, so, do you believe in ghosts? Oh yeah. I've seen have, one. Have you? Oh. Oh, do tell. Well, I mean, it's not the most exciting story, but I saw a ghost when I was 10. Mm. Uh, and it was it was in probably the most obvious place you'd expect, a cemetery. Um, my uh, mom and my sister, we, we lived very, uh, we, we lived, uh, well, my grand, we were visiting my grandparents and lived very, they lived very close to a cemetery. And I lived across, and for like most of my childhood, I actually lived across the street from a cemetery. So cemeteries were like playgrounds to me. And, um, you know, we uh, were walking in the cemetery and we're walking down this narrow path. The graves were on a hill on one side and then there was the fence and like this thick like wall of woods on the other side. And I was walking about 10 feet ahead of the two of them and they were talking and I was just walking ahead because I always walked way too fast for them. And I saw there's a mausoleum over on this side. And I saw like this shape, this just black kind of hole in the sky, like kind of it was like moved down the side of the hill, drift across the road in front of me, like maybe five feet in front of me and then disappear into the woods. And I have never been able to figure out what it was. It did not touch the ground. It didn't walk. It didn't move. It didn't bounce. It just glided. And it was just like this hole of blackness. And, uh, you know, ever since, I mean, I still remember it like very clearly. And I, my brain struggles to <laughs> translate what it was because it didn't make any sense. It was just this sort of vaguely, like almost like a human shaped void, you know? Well, that... you didn't understand. So yeah. we, we call it on our show is you know, on Eerie Travels. It's, it's some, you saw something you didn't understand. Don't know if right. it's a ghost. Don't know if it's. I'm pretty that's all whatever something you didn't understand so no I totally believe ghosts exist yep. oh I do too firm believer so does Mark Mark had a, uh, Mark had one of the last encounters with the ghost Mark had it opened the door to tell him to leave yeah that's yeah we, no, we caught that on YouTube uh <laughs> yeah. I was with three vloggers in a very haunted house and uh uh, right before Halloween, and I was just showing off this awesome old historical haunted house, and we locked ourselves in the attic to have a alone time with the spooky ghost up there. And the door like just flies open behind me after we'd locked it. It was it, we couldn't have asked for better. It was it, mm -hmm. it was right right up there. So. It was definitely but, hi. We're done with you now. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Five, five other five bloggers, and they all caught it on camera. And there's nobody else in the house but us. Did you so, take the advice? Oh yeah, we left. We, oh, they we, left right we, away. We were done. We we're. We we peaced out. They were all like, "Nope, we're done. We're done." I was yeah. like, "Yep, yep, it's time to go." Um, okay, so that said, all right, we're going back to Rome now. Who was your favorite emperor? Favorite emperor, um, probably uh, weirdly enough, Tiberius. He's the second one. He wasn't Not particularly exciting. Yeah, he wasn't <laughs> particularly exciting, but he was probably the one that I could relate to the most because he was an introvert forced into a job he didn't want, and his life was made entirely miserable by his dad. And his mom, if you read I Claudius, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, it's definitely she's Step the one father. who's pulling the strings, yeah. yeah. So okay. yeah, but uh, yeah, poor Tiberius, I, I agree. He yeah. was kind of forced into it, him. So yeah, and then Caligula killed him. Yeah, yeah. Voice, 
This is going back to Watership Down. John Hurt played him in I Claudius. Yeah. John Hurt was the voice of the rabbit in Watership yeah. Down. So I see how that's I see how you brought it in. I see what you're doing there. So uh, I I don't think that was him doing it. Get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody else is putting their own agenda into this podcast. <laughs> How dare you? Do you finish a book if it's not good? Uh, you know, I want to, I'm a completionist, but I don't force myself to read something I hate. I mean, there actually was a book that I read. I attempted very, I attempted, I, I attempted to, I, I attempt to finish everything. And I've even like bought multiple copies of it to try to do it. And I just can't, mm -hmm. you know, what is that? Um, well, I'm trying to remember, I can't remember the name of the, uh, the author, but, uh, uh, there was this, uh, novel that I read, uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but the novel was called Conquistador. It was a really interesting premise about a guy who like shortly after world war II, he, like he has a crystal radio set that turns to a certain frequency that accidentally blows a hole between his world and an alternate earth that has never been colonized where the United States has never been colonized. And he basically starts colonizing it from his from his side of this uh, of this interdimensional gateway. Uh, it sounds like it should be really interesting, but the plot is leaden. You know, it starts really interesting and then it slows way down. And I, I just, I mean, I want to finish it, but I just, I have never been able to. It's like. Uh, it's like the whole Zeno's paradox thing. Like, you know, you, you can never actually get to a destination because you always have to cross half of the remaining distance. And there was always half of the remaining distance to cross. I don't know, but it, 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 it that definitely felt like that. You know, it's, it's just like, uh, you know, it's like, I, it's, it's the plot should have been more interesting, but it wasn't. Yeah. No. Well, and you've done justice to this person by purchasing multiple copies of said book. And <laughs> so you've done them right by them. I always say that to people that <laughs> say they need to finish books the completest, I guess. I'm like, why? You've already given them the money. That's, like you've, I, you've done the thing. Like you I love have. the verified reviews on Amazon, if, even when even the bad ones, because you're like, hey, at least they bought the book. So yeah. they bought the book. Well done. High five. Have you gotten any bad reviews at all, by the way? I have. Yeah. Um, well, it's unfortunate because uh, I got one bad review that given the number of reviews I've gotten for my books at this point, it actually halved the star rating on that book. Ouch. But, um, you know, it was it was definitely from a guy who didn't get it, you know, who was like, I don't like I waited through this whole thing and this was what I got at the end. Boo. But, you know, I don't know. It was like the. I don't know. It was, it was kind of, it kind of reminded me of that, of that famous meme review of the woman who blamed Marie calendar from ruining her holiday when she burnt her own pie. Yeah. You know, you know that one? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, exactly. Like, oh, yeah. They didn't include baking instructions or anything. That was entirely the, the pie just spontaneously combusted for no reason and ruined your holiday, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Some, you know, and that's, uh, I was reviewing a, a horror movie the other day and one guy, you know, raked it over the coals because it was, it had zombies in it. And I'm mm. like, it, the movie is about zombies and you're, and you're rating it lower because it has zombies in it. Yeah. So yeah. I understand completely. Yeah. So. Well, and that's the thing about reviewers. It's like, you have to take everything. It's great. And when, you know, I had a person on who was like, yeah, I got a couple low reviews. I said, Oh really? And they're like, yeah, they were four stars. And I'm like, I wanted to reach through the screen and slap them and go, <laughs> that's not a low review. Like a low review is a low review. But at the same time, you know, I remember when I got my first one star review on a short story that I wrote and I read the one star review and I was like, yeah, this person didn't get it. And yeah. not bad. I mean, you can have your own opinion, have your own opinion. Right. But I've, I've been waiting for the day somebody walks up to me when I'm on a panel to give me shit about my book because I'm going to go, well, thank you very much for purchasing it. That's 100%. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, stuff. Thank you for your purchase. It's being nominated. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time to review it because uh, getting any reviews is good reviews. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, what is Madonna? There's no such thing as bad publicity. No. So I don't, I don't know that that's necessarily true anymore, but... Mm -hmm. 
So, but Mark, go ahead, ask a question, and then I'll ask the final one. Go for it. Okay. Last, my last question is: so you, you're you're a history buff. You you've done all these things. Have you been to Rome? Are you? Oh, yeah. are you okay. So, yeah. what is your dream historical destination? If you could travel in time and go back to one moment in time, where would it be, and why? Uh, I mean, I would probably, well, to, to answer your question, to start with, I've been to Rome twice and I've, uh, yeah, I, I met, I actually went there once to meet my uh, artist, uh, Giancarlo Caracuzzo for Amiculus. And that was a lot of fun. Um, honestly, I would love to visit, this is probably going to be obvious. I would love to visit Rome during the Augustan period because like, I feel like just like being in a place and a time with so many like larger than life human beings and, you know, just being able to experience, I'll bet it would smell really bad. I will say that for one, <laughs> you know, um, like You're the first person that's recognized that back. If you <laughs> go back, like people are always like, I'd like to go to the Renaissance. And I'm like, Oh, mm -hmm. up. no, you would not. Yeah. Bubonic plague. Let's just start there. Like you don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. Well, that was another reason. At least the Romans bathed. So there's yep. that, you know, they granted they bathed in giant communal like pools of soup. But that's essentially what public baths were. Yeah, but, but they still bathed, you know, twice a day. Yeah. Yeah. They scrape I mean, each other with combs. You know, it's yeah. you know, we're a step up from the primates, but we do what we can. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, Erica. Last question. Okay. Last question. If you could have lunch with any author dead or alive i mean they'd be alive while you were eating lunch with them regardless mm. of their previous death condition who would you have lunch with uh this is probably this is probably obvious too i mean I, I would love to have i would love to have a, a bite with neil gaiman honestly uh because partly because i remember reading in a re an interview that he actually prefers writing comics to uh to novels and he's written so both so very well but uh he said something about the uh the pacing of a comic book and the way the pacing of a graphic novel or a comic book and the way that you, you do that seems to work better with his thought process than a novel does. You can do things in comics that you can't with novels is what he said. So I'd love to know more about that. Have you um, done his master class? Oh, I need to do that. I haven't done it yet. I, I have done his master it. class. Yeah. Yes. Um, I will say there it's really interesting. Masterclass used to be this thing that was horribly expensive, but now you can do a monthly subscription to it. And he's one of the ones that I did at the time, you know. I need to do that. Very nice. Yeah, no, I definitely would. Okay, shameless self-promotion time. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's you, not me. I could talk yeah, about we, myself we, all we day. Self-promote ourselves all the time, so it's all good. But yeah, we're really good at it. Right. So, um, uh, like I said, I have uh, multiple titles. Amiculous Secret History is my uh, action adventure series in the vein of V for Vendetta or Assassin's Creed set during the fall of Rome, premised on the idea that uh, Rome in this did not fall, but was pushed by a mysterious figure tearing it all apart from the shadows. And it's done in a very epic style, lots of epic battles, conspiracies, betrayals, all swirling around this mysterious figure called Amiculus, who the Romans aren't even sure whether he's human or not. He's able to blow through anything and everything they put in his way uh, uh, and almost effortlessly. And uh, their being able to, their, their survival depends on figuring out who he is, how, why he's doing what he's doing, as well as the, uh, the survival of Western civilization. Uh, I also have two uh, one-shot horror comics, uh, Sugar Creek and In Noctum. I didn't get a chance to tell you about In Noctum. In Noctum is also set in ancient Rome. It's a vampire story more in the vein of, uh, it's been compared to 300 meets 30 days of night by my own readers. Uh, Sugar Creek is more along the lines of Stranger Things or It. And uh, I will also be coming out uh, with a new series, a mythology fantasy series called Pythia, The Last Oracle, first issue of that dropping in May. Uh, you'll be able to find more about these on my website, uh, amiculusrome.com. That's A-M-I-C-U-L-U-S, Rome, R-O-M-E.com. Uh, I sell on Amazon and I routinely uh, go to uh, uh, different uh, conventions and comic shows. So uh, you'll be able to find all about that at my website as well. Very cool. It was so much fun having you on here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad to do it. It was a lot yes. of fun.
Yeah, sorry that Mark brought up Buckaroo Banzai. I can't stop him. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a Tourette syndrome thing. I can't help it. <laughs> Guys, this has been Drinking with Authors, the literary briefs edition. I've been your host, Erica Lance. My co-host has been the amazing Mark Muncy from Erie Travels. No. Our guest has been Travis Horseman. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, comment, all of the above. And we will see you guys next time. And, and review the books. <laughs> yes. Review, review the books. books.